Hey everyone, Samantha here. Welcome to another episode of Trans IRL. I can't believe it, but this is already our eighth episode that we've produced here. And I think you're gonna really like the show that we have in store for you tonight. If you haven't seen our other episodes or if you're new to the channel, please go ahead and head over to our YouTube page and check those out. Don't be afraid to share those with your friends as well. Um, we've got a lot of great videos up there for you. Over on our Instagram page, Trans IRL, we do offer you the chance to submit your questions to our guests before we go live. So we want to make sure that you're aware of that. You follow us over there. And you'll also have a chance to see any bonus material that we put out for you. And we do put that out pretty regularly. Uh, this week, this is something new. We've really been working on our Facebook page. Our Facebook page is now fully operational. And um, if you don't like us on Facebook yet, please head over to Facebook and give us a like. Speaking of Facebook, let's bring Addison. Hi, Addison. <laughs> hey, how are you? So. Someone finally got around to creating a Facebook account this week. Yeah, so I created one, gosh, what was it, like Monday or Tuesday? And yeah, I did it so that I could help manage the Trans IRL page and hang out with everybody in the live chat. Um, and somehow I think I'm up to like 170 friends. I think it's some kind of spam thing. Anyways, tonight we're talking about health and fitness, and I'm really excited because it's a, top a topic that I'm passionate about, and I want to prove it to you. These are, these are older pictures of me from uh, 2017 before I realized I'm transgender. Um, this is back when I had a personal trainer, worked out three to six times a week, ate a ridiculously, ridiculously clean diet. Um, and I'm not going to lie, I've kind of fallen off the bandwagon since then, but um, I'm super excited for tonight's show because getting back into the gym is something that I'm very much looking forward to. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to this interview, and I'll have some questions of my own. I hope that you all have some questions in the chat for our guests. If you do leave them in the chat on YouTube or Facebook, I'll be keeping my eye on that. And if there's anything good in there, we'll, we'll sure to, uh, be sure to bring it up at the end of the show. Uh, real quick, I also do want to say uh, just thank you to everybody who reached out on Sunday, whether it was uh, you know, an, a DM, a phone call, a FaceTime call. It uh, really means a lot, so I appreciate that. And with that, I will send it back to you, Samantha. Thanks, Addison. And as always, Addison is in our control room monitoring the chat for us and appreciate her work over there. Um, so as we go through our show tonight, please make sure you submit your questions and we'll get to as many as we possibly can. On to tonight's topic. I think a lot of trans people turn to things that distract us from the pain that dysphoria brings. Uh, you know, especially those people that are in a position where they, they may not be able to transition for for any number of reasons. I know in my case in particular, I turn to projects, right? Projects around the house, but also computer projects, programming projects, things that made me think and things that kept me up really late at night to sort of distract my mind from those dysphoric thoughts that, you know, were really bringing me down. So tonight's guest, they didn't turn to a computer necessarily, but um, they, they turned to a, the gym and spent years powerlifting to try to push some of those feelings away. And I feel like this might be a familiar story for, for a lot of people out there. And I'm happy to bring her story to the wider audience tonight. So at this point, I'd like to say hey. hi to Allie Keeler. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you tonight? I'm doing pretty good other than it blizzarding outside. I know. So yeah, you're, you're up there where there's actual weather. <laughs> yes, I'm in Billings, Montana, and it is currently coming yeah. down... I could barely see out of my windshield when I got home. <laughs> and I was in a dress today, just for comparison here in sunny Phoenix. Sure, rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know, I know. But, you know, later on this summer when it's 110 degrees here and it's beautiful there, then, you know. Right, it'll be perfect face, here. <laughs> yep. Well, I'm glad you joined us here today. I, I do want to talk a little bit about your story. I think it's a really interesting story. And I think it's one that a lot of people can relate to. So I, I do I want to talk to. a little bit, just, you know, briefly about, uh, you know, where you grew up and where you went to school, things like that. God, where to begin? Well, it was a dark and stormy night. Um, I grew up in Spokane, Washington, in a very, very conservative household. Uh, I didn't go without anything. I had a very loving family. Um, I was always kind of the awkward child, so to speak. Um, always very quiet, always very um, withdrawn, 
maybe even a little bit uh, apathetic at times. Most of my friends were girls. Most of my, you know, I, I didn't really get into sports very much. I spent most of my days sitting around reading dinosaur books. So that was my big thing. Anybody that's watching me is going to be like, oh, yeah, I remember that, that that I went to school with or has known me for a long time that's tuning in. Um, I don't know if you want me to go into like earliest recognition of dysphoria at this point. Yeah, let's go ahead and talk about that. Um, you know, okay. when did you first recognize some of those signs? Oh, sure. Um, I guess when I was very, very little, I knew that I was different. At, I'll say, I'll say, I'll start with different. Um, uh, like I said, I was always kind of the the odd child out, always very, very effeminate. I would watch my mom put on her makeup and just kind of watch in awe. And she would put little curlers in my hair and I'd make little kissy faces when she was putting on her makeup. Um, if I was in daycare or something, I would always put on the dresses and the clip-on earrings. So um, I did not really know how to describe myself per se until I was about 14 years old. I read an article in a Teen People magazine. I don't even know if that's in print anymore, but I, uh, I read an article about transgender teens and it clicked with me. And I was like, wow, this is what I'm reading is completely what I have always felt. But because of you know, the times, early 2000s, and my family being very conservative, very, very traditional, and kind of a lot of unspoken pressure by my dad to live up to the status quo that he expected as his, um, I guess, golden child, for lack of a better word to describe it, I did my very, very best to lock it away and be who I was expected to be and kind of fall in line and do what boys are supposed to do. And I did that as so long as I possibly could. Teen years there. Did you ever try to talk about this with anyone else? Did it ever come up or, or did you just push it, never push came it down up. right away? It never came up yeah. at all when I was in high school. Um, I think the very first time I told another soul was probably... Oh, I want to say 2007 or 2008. And I confided in a very good friend of mine. If she's watching tonight, um, thank you, Sarah. And I love you. And thank you for believing in me. Um, over a period of time, I kind of started to open up to more and more people. Um, you know, ninety-nine percent of them were were female friends. And there were a lot of people that had known me for a while that were just like, well, that makes sense. That there's a lot of signs. And uh, I, it was kind of just a secret that I kept for so long. I mean, at this point, I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything fitness-wise. I was, I was still kind of a geek. I was really big into cars at the time. Um, I kind of tried to live the fast and furious lifestyle for a bit. Um, at least at that time, that was what I hid behind. And uh, yeah, and that's sort of what I led with in the episode here that I think a lot of us had something that we did hide behind early on, right? Oh, yeah. And, and the two yeah, for me, it was just one age, thing after another within a year or so of each other. So I think we both found out, you know, what it meant to be transgender about that same time in those early teen years. But, you know, we were always looking for some sort of distraction. So you had cars for a while there. Um, when did you get into the gym life? Um, the very first time I ever went into the gym, really, in earnest, was after my first marriage uh, imploded. Uh, in 2009, I started out in the gym just as a, something to build confidence and feel better about myself because I'd been very browbeaten for a long period of time. That picture there is about 2016, um, which is, we'll get to that too. That was kind of a, a pivotal time, and I think this was taken just before everything kind of hit the fan. Um, it's still really weird for me to see stuff like that, even though I, I post pictures all the time. Um, I kind of slowly eased into the whole gym bro world over 
four or five years, kind of around 2012, 2013. I genuinely uh, loved it and took an interest in it and found it very fulfilling. I loved the challenge. Uh, I've had desk jobs for the last, you know, forever now. And uh, when you sit at a computer all day, it's very, very therapeutic to get up and go be active and do something. And um, for me, you know, being the nerdy child growing up, I always felt like I had something to prove. So it was kind of a, a chance for me to do a, a 180 degree turn and maybe be the, the big tough person for a change. And, and at that point, I was kind of kidding myself as far as who I was and, and what was driving me. And um, sorry, my cat just came into the room. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's talk about when you found that, you know, when you turn or you realize that your time in the gym, you know, maybe more than just you trying to build confidence that it may have been hiding something deeper. Okay. Around 2014, I attempted to come out to my mother. I stopped short of saying the words transition or transgender, but I described it as I am feeling like I have this feminine side and I feel that I am conflicted with who I am, who I should be, and how I should express myself. So I, I, I basically led into it a little bit without actually saying the words. Um, this was not very well received. And um, from then on for several years, um, I threw myself into the gym tried to cultivate as much of a hyper-masculine persona as I possibly could, tried to get as big as I could, as strong as I could, you know, suck down close to 300 grams of protein a day, follow all of the, the, the bodybuilder bro YouTubers out there, worship Arnold Schwarzenegger, the whole nine yards. Um, I fit the cliche to a T. <laughs> uh, you see me with a shaker bottle at almost any given time of the day. And uh, I did that for about, I did that until August of 2016. My mom had a, a massive heart attack and that was what kind of brought, she survived, but uh, um, that brush with mortality was what really brought these feelings up to the point where I couldn't ignore them anymore. You know, I, I, I fought it as long as I could. I tried to, to put a, a wall up that nobody else could pen it, you know, nobody could see through whatsoever. And uh, eventually something just in life managed to find its way through that. And, and, and this little voice just said, don't, you know, you can't ignore me anymore. So let's talk about that a little bit. When you first started coming out to your family, um, you know, your parents, your wife, uh, relatives, how, how did that go for you? Um, like I said, there had been a few people that in, on my group of friends that I had confided in. And of course, I, I was unsure exactly how to, to interpret things for a while. Uh, you know, I didn't know. Um, am I just very, very feminine? Am I gay? Am I this? Am I that? You know, we're all in a hurry to label ourselves, of course. <laughs> um, but uh, when I finally got to the point where I, I realized I need to do something about this, um, I sat my wife down and I said, I, I need to transition. I'd already told her that I struggled with this before... Um, before I, before we got married, again, around the same time that I tried to come out to my mom in 2014, but um, she was the first person I actually said the words, I want to transition, I need to transition, and that was spring of 2017. From there, I started seeing a gender therapist. I started laser hair removal in May. Uh, this is all while still presenting quite masculine. And, uh, you know, I, um, I started experimenting as far as my presentation at home, trying clothes, trying makeup. Of course, my, my wife, bless her heart, was very, very much uh, kind of a, a torchbearer and, and, you know, helped me out a ton 
especially in those early days, and she's very, very fiercely protective. Um, and when I finally did come out to my parents, it was like a nuclear bomb went off, both in my life, their life, and then just in terms of the grand scheme of things as far as transition goes, because with that hurdle and that biggest fear of disappointing my dad, first and foremost, it was almost like I had the, the green light. You know, what else am I waiting for at this point? Why am I, why am, else am I hiding if I don't have to worry about that anymore? Uh, my parents were not initially receptive at all. My dad uh, disowned me completely and has seen me a grand total of once at my brother's birthday party this last July. Um, the vast majority of my family and friends have been overall very supportive. A few people were initially supportive and have kind of since moved to keeping me at arm's length. They're just, I don't really know what to do with this. I don't really know how to interpret this. You know, good luck kind of thing. Um, but there's definitely been a handful of people who have been cheering me on. And when I came out at, you know, at long last, there was a, quite a few people that were like, finally, <laughs> we knew that, that this was what you needed to do. We knew that this was inevitable. We, we were waiting. Welcome, kind of, you know, welcome to the club kind of thing. And so many people had welcomed me with open arms, more so than I could have ever imagined. So in 2016, we saw that photo of you, uh, where you know you were you were still in that bulking phase of your life. Uh, I mean, that's oh, yeah. basically where you were when you started down this process, right? That picture is actually May 2017. That was me right when I, I think that was taken shortly before I had my first laser treatment. I was okay. In one way, I was, I knew that transition was was inevitable, and I had told myself that I would compete on stage. And after I had that closure, then I could transition. Fate just ended up working much differently. So let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about your experience then. Okay, you're going forward with transition. What does all that time and energy that you're putting into the gym look like to you? How did, how did you process that at that point? It was very, very awkward, at least for the first few months. I would say the first four or five months, or you know, at least the, that last end of the gym or the last end of the year, um, I was going to a really kind of hardcore bodybuilding gym. There was a lot of of really big guys uh, taking a lot of things, and it was you know your cliche hyper masculine bro gym. And I was very, very conscious that, you know, I had started hormone therapy very shortly after I came out to my parents. And for the last couple months of that year, I was very aware, you know, if I was wearing a t-shirt, people might be able to notice things. Um, I had more than one person come up to me and say, dude, you're shrinking. What's going on? You look different. Uh, what What's up with that? And Thankfully, I managed to, you know, I decided that in order for my own mental health, I needed to get out of that gym in particular. And um, I went back to my my longtime favorite, my Anytime Fitness, they're wonderful, um, where I'm still going today. Um, and there I've never had any issues. Uh, by about February of 2017, when I was five or six months in, um, I was able to, you know, dress how I wanted to dress still, of course, self-conscious because I was still bigger. Um, and I knew I didn't, um, I knew I didn't pass at all. I don't, I still don't think I pass. I think I blend decently at times, but I, I know I don't pass per se, but, um, I do think that you know after that initial awkward phase of adjusting to you know being able to let that persona down uh, go of, of I don't have to be this super big um, macho person anymore. I can go in and pursue my own goals for me, what makes me feel good as a person 
rather than trying to reinforce the walls. And that was what fitness ended up turning into. And I think that's very much for the better. So let's talk about that a little bit as well. How, you know, we talk about your goals before and your goals now, like what are you, what's your primary driving focus while you're, while you're in the gym today? Um, I have changed my methods a bit. I'm never going to be a cardio queen per se, because treadmills are definitely boring, <laughs> but I, uh, I still power lift. I, I still work on my big compound lifts. I'm not trying to maintain, you know, boyish proportions per se. Of course, hormones have a lot to do with that, regardless of how you train. Um, you are going to lose size regardless of what you do and how you exercise. That's just the nature of the beast and how your body will work. But um, my ultimate goal is to kind of ride out the waves of this initial first couple years of uh, hormone therapy while my metabolism is in free fall and <laughs> my body kind of getting used to a new way of doing things and maintain as much strength as I can, even though it's dropping. And uh, hopefully allow fat to go to the good places and keep fat off of the bad places. Do you actually, do you have numbers for any uh, dimensions that you've lost just bulk wise? Do you, as far do you as you my build? Uh, yeah. I had a 44 inch width around my shoulders and chest. 44 to 40, somewhere between 44 and 46. I had, um, I'm about a 38 now, as far as like wow. a bra size, I guess. So I've lost a lot of thickness there. My arms were about 17 and three quarters at their largest. And I think I'm down to a little over 14, 14 and a half. Waist size really hasn't changed all that much, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> hips and, and backside definitely is a lot wider than it used to be, but I'm not going to complain about that. <laughs> yeah, you I haven't measured it recently. Too, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. My well, weight, thank, honestly, I mean, has not sharing. changed. The... Oh, no, not at all. Um, in that side-by-side -side picture that Addison had put up a bit ago, I think on the left side I was... At my largest, that one there, I want to say I was about 210 pounds. And then on the right, I'm, I'm still hovering at about 190. I'm 5'11", so I'm never going to be a super tiny girl. Like I said, unless I wanted to hop on the cardio wagon and, and starve myself. But I think that my restraining myself from doing so has been a big factor in my retaining the strength that I have. Eventually, I'm going to end up tapering down from that a little bit as well and then building it back up in a more uh, feminine pattern. Right. So, I mean, that's part of the stir of the muscles and allow some of that redistribution to happen there as well, right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And I also think that, like I said, your your body is going to change regardless of what you do in the gym. Um, of course, if you don't work out at all and, and don't watch your diet, it's going to be, it can be messy <laughs> and it can uh, be very difficult to, to control. Um, you know, definitely my metabolism has slowed down a lot being on hormone therapy. I know that my body fat percentage has probably doubled from what it was before. Uh, even if my weight has not changed a dramatic amount, I can still see my body composition change, which is very hard from the mindset that I used to have as far as being okay with that. But at the same time, I, I know that one, it's part of hormones, so in one way it's very validating and affirming, but at the same time, like I said, eventually things will even out and be easier to work with. And I think that going about this in a very slow manner, preserving as much strength as I can, letting things even out, and then trying to lean down, rather than you know, going extremely catabolic, cutting down my calories to... 1,000, 1,200 calories a day, very little protein, 
even a, a vegan stint. That's not for me because I like steak, but, <laughs> um, and then, you know, just abandoning the weights altogether. I see a lot of people do that. And I, I always think in this whole quest to be true to ourselves, if I were to do anything other than what brought me joy, which powerlifting does bring me joy, it, it of course, it, it is therapeutic in different ways now because, like I said, it's not a, a shield. It genuinely is something that I find to be empowering um, that uh, it, would be, it would defeat the whole purpose of this journey in a way because that's the whole point is to, to be ourselves right. at, at long last of, of all things. So in my way, in my case, that's one way that I'm being true to myself while steering something that previously was very much a coping mechanism into something that's positive and, and uh, really does bring me a lot of peace. And it's a great way to break stereotypes. Absolutely. Strong women are out there, right? Yes. Somebody has to, uh, you know, it's kind of <laughs> like, uh, it's almost like Hook where, where Peter Pan gives the sword to the biggest, <laughs> the biggest boy at the end and says, you have to watch out for all the, the, the lost boys that are smaller than you. So I get to be that girl. <laughs> well, that's awesome. And, you know, the work you do online, uh, sharing your story and being visible, being a strong woman. I think there's a lot of people that, that look up to you for that. I know I look up to you for it. I know that I need to do better at taking care of myself, especially where I'm at in transition. Um, so yeah, you're, you're very inspirational in the work you do, Allie. Well, thank you. I think that I also have a right. chance being... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I wanted to start getting to the, the questions because we have a lot of questions that were submitted oh, perfectly uh, for fine. you here. Perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, so let's go to our first one here. Uh, when you're first starting out, how many times a week do you recommend going to the gym? Well, that depends on how many days you're prepared to go to the gym. And if you have any kind of idea as to how you respond, I mean, if you have a, a if you're in shape or out of shape, I would say start very slow, maybe like a full body workout three days a week and ease into it. If you're in shape and are fairly active and you just want to start lifting, I would say four to five days is almost perfect. I've done six, seven days a week. I've done two weeks on end before. I can't do it now to the same uh, level. And I feel that my performance definitely suffers in the gym. Um, but I think personally, four or five is an ideal place to start. And you know, provided that you train intelligently and you work out a split that works for you. Now, by split, I'm, I mean, um, like two of the things that I have found to be most effective is like splitting your workouts in upper and lower. So if you were doing four workouts a week, you could do upper, lower, upper, lower with the day off one, you know, in between two days and then go work out two more days and then take two days off. Um, or you can do a push-pull split or push-pull legs split, or you can combine the two into uh, a five-day workout. There's so many different ways that you can do. You could do push-pull legs up or lower, or you can just mix and match whatever works for you one week to the next. I mean, that's the beauty part of it, but that's kind of what I end up doing most of the time. Um, being a power lifter, I base all of my uh, workouts off of the three big lifts, the deadlift, squats, and bench press. Those are my bread and butter. Every single workout involves one of those, except tonight because somebody was using the squat rack on end and I didn't get a chance to, but that's okay. Um, starting your workouts with a very, you know, a big compound lift, going particularly heavy, trying another compound lift, slightly less weight, and then throwing in some accessory exercises um, to kind of touch up and tone the rest of the areas, and then finishing up with cardio. 
20, 30 minutes a couple times a week, I think, is perfect for just about anybody. There's no need to spend 45 minutes to an hour slogging away on a treadmill. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> <laughs> I like running. <laughs> eh. but, uh, I've, I'm not built, I'm not built for running. I can do short bursts. This, this next question here. This next question is a really important one for a lot of people in the trans community. Um, I know it's something that you face on a daily basis. How do you deal with the changing room situation at the gym? I happen to have lucked out a bit. Thankfully, the people, the kind people at, at any time, my any time at least, um, were very, very cool with me as far as giving me a key to the staff restroom. So if I needed to change, um, I could. However, most days, and I actually did this before or pre-transition anyways, was to... You know, every day I would take my gym bag with me to work. I would usually change before I went to the gym, or at least during the work week. Uh, when I worked out in the evenings or on the weekends, when I work out in the mornings, I just change at home. I mean, I, I will still use the women's restroom, but I think I've only changed in there once. So I've I've found a convenient way around it, and I live five minutes away from the gym, so... I, I haven't had a reason or a need to change there yet. But I think that if I was going to give advice to anybody, I would say, ask your gym staff if there's any kind of accommodations that they could make. I mean, I know that not all gyms have a staff restroom or, or a second restroom. Um, I'm thankful that mine does. And it's actually worked out really nice. But if, you're, if your gym is at least able to be aware you know, that there are trans people present, which we're everywhere, so that goes without saying. But if, if you are at least able to give them a heads up um, as to at least make them mindful uh, in case there are people that are taken off guard by your presence, um, which I haven't had that I issue I think that's yet smart, either, but... right? Engaging the, the staff at the gym to yes. make sure that they're on board, and that they 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 know you, they know your face, and they have your back, hopefully, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I don't want to go to a yep. gym where I they don't have my back. And I, I think it's great what, what your gym has done, and they've, they've given you uh, an option there. But I, I think for, you know, people in states where there there are protections for, for trans individuals to use the restrooms and changing rooms of their choice, you know, I, I think that if people are comfortable using those restrooms, it's important that they're able to use those restrooms as well. So, right. um, of course, we want to make sure people are safe. And I think your, your point about engaging management at the gym is, is important. Yep. Yep. No surprises, people at the right? gym have surprisingly been very, very cool with me. I haven't had any kind of issues whatsoever, which I was very scared uh, being in a popular gym in Billings, Montana, of all places, where finding an out invisible trans person is like finding a unicorn, for lack of a better way to describe it. So <laughs> I was fully prepared to, to take people off guard. And thankfully, I had been a presence there for many years. And some people had seen me before, and some people hadn't. So, you know, I don't know if, if every time somebody... Uh, um, signs up at the gym. They're like, just so you know. <laughs> so let's talk um, about your work at the gym with our next question here that was submitted. Okay. Have your lifts continued to go up in weight uh, after transition or did you hit a wall? I would say hit a titanium wall. Um, it is very, very hard to at least for me to have imagined just how much even regular levels of testosterone impact one's strength. Um, not only do you have the presence of much greater red blood cells to carry oxygen to the muscles, you also have much higher nitrogen retention. You have greater glycogen storing abilities. Um, your metabolism works in a completely different way. Uh, Yes, my lifts have absolutely dropped, and I actually do have actual metrics uh, as far as where I was at very to uh, when I started transition. 
versus where I'm at now, and I would be ha more than happy to share those. Do you actually have those numbers? Oh, yeah. Um, around August to September of 2017, I was still powerlifting, even though I was very much on this inevitable course. Um, my maxes for deadlift, uh, those went from 555 pounds down to about 415. And the newer uh, maxes are all within the last week or two. Uh, bench press went from 325, which I always struggled with because I have uh, bad shoulders on both sides. Uh, that went from 325 to 225, which I was able to do on just this last week, actually. And then my squats went from 405, which I was very hard for me to get up there because just my... I have very tight Achilles tendons and high arches, so like I said, I'm not a runner, and it is hard for me to project power down into the floor through my heels properly, so that was a very hard-fought 405. Um, that has dropped down to about 275. Wow. I mean, those so. are significant decreases, and, and these are pushing, right, to, to get strength back these are, numbers. These are, right now, I've mostly been trying to maintain I mean, I, I don't know okay. if I'll be able to sustain where these at. They haven't. They have been dropping for a while now. I don't know if they're going to drop. Um, I don't know how far they're going to drop further. And everything that I know tells me that as I drop body mass or weight and adjust my diet, the greater likelihood that that strength will continue to drop. I mean, all of those uh, maxes are usually achieved when carbs are really, really high, uh, when you're really, really hydrated. And all of those other factors, including your sleep quality, all of those things come in are, are factors regardless, but they're much, much more of a factor in the absence of testosterone. So. Absolutely. All right, this next question here is another good one. Working out sometimes increases my dysphoria, and does that ever happen to you? It has not happened. It has not happened in a very long time. The first four or five months when I was adjusting, um, yes, when I was trying really hard to let go of that alpha persona, um, it was very hard because I, I had a lot of imposter syndrome because I still looked quite like a bro, but I knew what path I was on. So I was, I was very, very much, you know, I, I felt very in the middle. I felt very awkward around the people that I had worked out and, and, and socialized with in the gym before that just assumed that I was the same person that they'd seen in there for the last year or so. But uh, once I kind of hit my stride, and was able to allow myself to present female in the gym, but to, to be my authentic self, to not care about how I looked. Um, dysphoria in the gym is a non-issue, and honestly, it's one of the places I put the least amount of effort into passing. <laughs> um, I don't really worry about how I'm perceived so much as, uh, as I think anybody Care. Anybody that's truly in the gym to better themselves is more focused on their own workout, their own performance, than they are the people around them. And I think that anybody who spends so much of their time watching and critiquing other people, whether they're different, whether they're trans, whether they're of a different ethnicity, if there's uh, uh, a person of color in there, I don't think that anybody should be, or, or somebody who's just out of shape, uh, anybody who's paying attention to somebody else at the expense of their own workout, really needs to ask themselves about their priorities. So I think um, I, I've been very lucky in that regard to not feel like I have all eyes on me while I'm in the gym and I can just go about my own workout. I can do my thing and I can go home without a second thought. That is such a great analogy though. It's because what you said about the gym is kind of the same thing with life in general, right? I mean, we yeah. are all trying to be our best selves who has the time to, you know, 
invest energy into putting somebody else down, right? When when what most of us should be focused on is is just taking care of ourselves. And I don't know, for some reason that just struck me when you said that, that yeah, this is this is fits for the gym, but it's real life too, right? Right. Well, I I think that a lot of people, like I said, seeing it, I'm probably the very first trans person that some of these people have seen before. And the fact that I'm not in there living up to whatever portrayal that the, the right wing media has that I, my, I, my sole existence in there is to watch other women in the restroom or creep people out or, or be there for shock factor. I'm there lifting weights. I'm not running around in a tutu and a rainbow colored wig going, Hey, look at me. Look how fabulous I am. Oh my gosh. Um, I think people can respect that. I think that people will look at me and just be like, okay, trans person working out, you do you. And I think that's how the attitude that everybody should have. So um, the fact that I get that opportunity to be kind of an ambassador and show that we're just people trying to live our lives and better ourselves um, is a privilege. And it's one that I don't really acknowledge as much as I should, but I really do feel that I have kind of an opportunity, like an unofficial opportunity to just be me and in doing so just, you know, show that we're, we're just like everybody else. I couldn't have said it better myself. That was perfect. <laughs> All right, let's look at our next question here. Are you able to continue to lift without getting too bulky? Now, for that one, <laughs> we have to define bulky because you are not going to build excess amount of muscle. If you're already a muscular person, you're going to lose muscle regardless. If you get your testosterone levels down and your estrogen levels up, you're going to lose muscle. Regardless of how hard you train, you're going to lose some. Uh, as you guys saw in that other picture, I've lost a lot of volume. Um, however, you if you don't watch what you eat, which diet is, and it's, it's it would be great if I could follow my own advice all the time because it's really hard to to keep as much discipline as before, and I'll admit that too. Uh, it is very easy to put on unwanted bulkiness in terms of body fat in the wrong places. But the short answer to that question is, yes, you absolutely can work out without gaining a whole lot of upper body bulkiness, which is what I'm assuming that this person was asking. Um, I think so, yeah. Um, if you, if your hormone levels are, are where they need to be and you're going through a doctor, as I would highly recommend that anybody that is on HRT is doing, um, or at least getting their, their blood work checked routinely, um, you are going to lose muscle size regardless. And without testosterone present, it's inevitable. The rate at which you lose that is, is also very dependent on how much you exercise, how you exercise, what your diet consists of. Um, like I said, I am sure that my exercising in the manner that I do has staved off some of that muscle loss. When the day comes that I have to take a couple of weeks off of the gym, I'm very much prepared and accepting of the fact that I will have to uh, be okay with losing some muscle size and strength that I may not ever quite get back to where it was before that time. So right now it's all about maintenance for me, but yes, you absolutely can work out without getting bulky. All right. Next question here. What can I do to lose upper body mass and gain more hip definition while in the gym? So definitely another question from uh, a trans feminine individual here. Okay. Um, so as far as methods go, the big compound movements, your deadlifts, your squat variants, you could include leg press, anything that works multiple muscle groups at one time are going to be your bread and butter. Um, a lot of the guys cis or trans men that you see that are trying to gain upper body muscle size 
are usually doing many, many exercises of isolation movements, lots of curls, lots of shrugs, lots of exercises that work one muscle group at a time. They'll do this in very high volume, sometimes moderate weight, over and over and over and over again because they're chasing the pump. <laughs> um, if that is not your goal, then I would highly recommend not training that way. So, like I said, working on the, the bigger compound movements is going to be much more productive in terms of overall muscle stimulation while not engaging hypertrophy or muscle growth. And again, in the absence of testosterone, what you do makes, in the end, it makes very little difference because you will lose muscle size regardless. But how you do train will dictate how fast that happens and to the extent that it happens. I don't do a lot of, uh, I do very little arm work. I do very little shoulder work anymore. Um, direct arm work, you know, spending lots of time doing uh, curls is not the most productive thing for us. So things that hit multiple muscle groups at one time, um, preferably um, spread out over the week, I think is much more um, productive as, than, you know, seven or eight bicep exercises, seven or eight tricep exercises, where as if you do a bench press, you're working your pectorals and you're indirectly working your shoulders and your triceps. Whereas if you're doing a row or a pull down, you're primarily working your back, but you're also working your biceps. So you don't have to do direct arm work. You can indirectly stimulate them without going overboard and worrying about getting too big and bulky. Now, as far as the other part of that question, um, everybody will say that squats are king as far as like glutes. But I think that also depends on your, your biomechanics. There are a lot of people that respond much better uh, with deadlifts. And um, I'm one of those people that responds very, very well to deadlifts as far as hamstrings go. Uh, your glutes are also very, very important if you're a trans feminine person. Um, you are going to be very hard pressed to find anything more effective than a glute bridge or a hip thrust variant. Uh, those are kind of the king for developing that part of the body. Um, in terms of how I train, I've definitely shifted my bias towards lower body versus upper body. I still train everything, but I do, I have shifted a lot of focus towards lower body, much more so. I probably do a leg workout maybe three or four times a week, and then upper body, maybe half that on average. So, all right, let's look at our next question here. And this was sort of a general question. I think, uh, how should I adjust my calorie intake on HRT? And I would say for, for the purposes of our conversation, Allie, how would you adjust your calorie intake going from a body that runs on testosterone to a body that runs on estrogen? Okay, as far as calories, um, the composition of those calories has dropped dramatically where I would at one time consume anywhere between 260 to 280 grams of protein a day. That has dropped down to around 100 to 120 a day. Um, I'm not sucking down protein shakes two or three times a day anymore. I get a lot of that of those uh, proteins from eggs and egg whites, um, chicken, turkey, uh, Greek yogurt, whole foods. Um, the best way that I would uh, that I would suggest, um, as as far as trying to to maintain your body from going into like a metabolic free fall, which it can do and very likely will on HRT. Uh, yes, you do have to consume fewer calories. Um, 
how many calories you need to drop. I think that depends on your activity level. So eventually, the, the thing that's going to help most people is to uh, look at their activity level, be very honest about their activity level. If you have a desk job and you work out really hard, you would still count that time that you spend sedentary. Um, there's so many calculators online for your TDEE, your total daily energy expenditure. Um, whatever you were consuming before, you can pretty much safely start with subtracting anywhere from 250 to 500 calories and seeing how that works for you. There's definitely no one size fits all and I'm still trying to figure out exactly what kind of calorie intake I need because I do have a desk job. I do sit at a computer all day and then I end up working out for an hour, hour and a half and that ends up having to be my activity for the day while well, the rest of it is largely sedentary. So I can't claim that I'm extremely active because I'm not out there running marathons from sunrise to sundown with intermittent breaks. I'm literally sitting on my backside all day and then hoping that I spend my time in the gym wisely. And you definitely can't out train a bad diet. So even if you are drenched in sweat, uh, you've gotten the best muscle stimulation session of your life in the gym. If you go home and, and eat garbage, it's not going to work out very well. But yeah, definitely, right. um, definitely have to cut back calories in some way. And rather than just crash dieting on like a thousand calories to 1200, I would say bare minimum, um, it, it's not usually sustainable to go below 1,500 to 1,600 calories for an extended period of time if you're trying to maintain course, some kind of level. You know, for people in this situation too, they, they should probably consult a nutritionalist as well if they're yeah. they're really looking at where they need to be. And they need to also ex they also need to examine what their goals are. If they are wanting to maintain some kind of strength or are they wanting to just is their dysphoria tied to their musculature? I mean, are they wanting to be as small as they possibly can in order to fight that dysphoria? In which case, yes, you may need to do a severe caloric restriction uh, for a short period of time. Would I recommend that? Not necessarily. But in my case... I kind of rock being the whole being the Amazon of my circle. So this girl likes to eat. <laughs> <laughs> and you do rock it. Yeah, All right, let's talk I, more about uh, gym stuff here. Uh, with our next question, we talked about this a little bit earlier too. How and when did you feel comfortable presenting female uh, or presenting feminine while at the gym? Um. I would say, like I said, about four to five months in was when I first kind of started shifting. Gosh, I should have sent the picture of uh, me the very first time I wore, quote, women's clothes to the gym. Um, that was a, a, a you know, I, po I remember posting a picture on, Am on uh, Instagram and saying, what do you guys think my chances of getting beat up today are? If I wear this mm -hmm. to the gym, am I going to get attacked? And everyone's like, oh, no, you look great. Go rock it. Do you? And and it wasn't. It ended up not being a big deal. But thankfully, that time was in about this same time of year. So it was cold. So I could dress in layers. I didn't have to worry about people seeing my chest or anything like that as it was developing. Um, I could wear a hat or a headband and... I, I eased into it. You know, I didn't just, uh, you know, bright colored leggings and a tank top with a, a visible sports bra the very first day. That came much later. <laughs> but um, it's definitely kind of a, short, a slower shift. As with most transitions, I think a lot of us end up going through kind of an androgynous phase. I know I did several months, both in, in my day-to-day -day presentation, uh, how I dressed and... and um, presented it in the workplace and then also in the gym it was kind of a not obviously feminine way but it was definitely not 
the hyper masculine presentation that I had before, and that's what worked for me personally. Um, your mileage may vary. Mm -hmm. Well, we saved the the heavy hitter questions for the end here, so <laughs> let's get Bring to em. this one. How do you tuck for the gym, and is it safe to do large muscle movements while tucked? When you showed me this question earlier, it was one of the ones I knew that it would I'd have to put some thought into as far as answering. Yeah. The easy answer to this is I would, I mean, if you're in a, a class where everybody's looking in the mirror and critiquing everybody, maybe consider tucking. However, if you're doing heavy workouts with weights, tucking of any kind, I think, could open up the potential for a lot of injuries. So I would almost suggest be as comfortable as you possibly can, regardless of your anatomy, and maybe be more mindful about what kind of clothes you're wearing. I mean, maybe wear something that's not quite so tight or, or is a little bit more loose fitting in that area because compressing that part of your body between your legs uh, while you're trying to do heavy deadlifts. I know if I was trying to, to pick up 400 pounds off of the floor while tucked, it would not be a, a pleasant experience. And it would take away from your full range of motion. The, the, your ability to bend and pull would be kind of compromised and awkward. So you're already in an uncomfortable, strained situation. I would not add to it. So I would be very, very selective about your need to tuck in the gym. And again, I would just be more mindful about what you're wearing. No gray sweatpants. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that was the end of our pre-submitted questions. So I do want to pull Addison into the conversation here. Hey, Addison. Yes. Hey. I would love to hear some questions from you. So, so, so Addison, the, the former gym, gym rat here, she, yes. she actually has some questions for you as well. Fire okay, so, away. So my personal question is, how did you manage like going to the gym while you were doing electrolysis and had you know, the scabbing, the redness, the irritation? Thankfully, when I've done laser and electrolysis in the past, um, my face has reacted fairly well. I don't usually have bad scarring and, and scabbing. Um, the only time I'm ever really self-conscious is maybe the last day before I work out or before I get it done. Um, usually when I do electrolysis, it's on a Friday night. So that following Saturday morning, when I go into the gym, I might throw on some BB cream. You know, I'm not going to put on the nice makeup to go to the gym. <laughs> But uh, I might throw on some concealer or something just to kind of cover the, the redness and the bumpiness because, yes, there is some. But otherwise, it, it's, it's not too much of an issue, thankfully. I've seen some people that, that they, they get very red and, and irritated with their skin. And, you know, like this last week, I, I had a very aggressive... Uh, derma sweep facial done and my face is just now recovering from it um, I, I had posted on Instagram and I was like it looks like the Imperial fleet did an orbital bombardment of my face <laughs> it, it looks so red and and cracked and irritated especially on my cheeks um, I was very self-conscious about that and if I could if I was in a position where I could wear gobs of makeup to cover it I would and then I'd run home and wash my face so that my skin did not suffer um, so yeah, just being very, very, you know, I, I, I feel your pain. <laughs> I do. <laughs> it, it sounds like you have a better time with redness and, and scabbing than I do. I think, I, I think I've lucked out fairly well. I was, I remember I was scared the very first time I had laser done. I was expecting to look like Deadpool. But thankfully, I just looked <laughs> like I had a mild sunburn and it wasn't that bad. I, I do find though, Addison, that if you apply an ice yeah. pack right after electrolysis, or or maybe like a full face ice mask. I wish I had with, one. Uh, eye holes I cut wish out, I had one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that that usually does help me um, coming out of electrolysis. If I apply ice early, then usually by the next day, I'm I'm doing pretty well. I do know though though that some of those earlier electrolysis sessions where you still have a high density of hair, they're really hitting hard. 
those ones took longer to, you know, have the swelling uh, subside. But uh, ice definitely helps either way. Okay, some some great tips, Addison. There. How long yeah. are your how long are your electrolysis sessions when you're going? So I've been doing two hours every week, and I just started that maybe the past month or so. See, I've done two hour sessions before, but I usually spread them out every other week so that my skin had a chance to heal. Mm. That may be something to consider as far as I mean, if I was doing every week. I might not have as much luck with my skin as I've had. So um, I think giving your skin a chance to heal a little bit might be something that's worth trying if it's if it's an issue. So then it becomes the, the contest between dysphoria and wanting to let your skin yep. actually heal, right? Yep, and that's hard. I, 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 I totally was doing understand it weekly. that. I did mine weekly for almost a year. So just to try to knock out as much as I could. I feel like oh, we yeah. could do and a whole episode. Oh yeah, that gets very time consuming. <laughs> I know we we might just need to do an electrolysis episode. <laughs> yeah. So there were some questions in the chat. I do want to get to Erin D's. Uh, she asked, "When you started HRT, did you have, did you have to adjust to new limitations as far as how much you were capable of lifting, how fast you could run, things like that?" Not right away. I think that for the first six to eight months it was a very slow decline a slow perceptible change um honestly the, the biggest changes for me were you know there was a, a bit of an initial strength drop and then it kind of plateaued and slowed down for a while and was like well this isn't so bad i noticed my muscle volume shrink but as far as performance you know only fairly recently did it really start to accelerate and get to the point where it's like, wow, stuff's really starting to hit hard now. Um, so I wouldn't say that I, that it was too hard of an adjustment. It was, you know, it, like I said, during that um, early awkward in between phase where you're presenting. Like I remember being really self conscious that when people are used to seeing you move four or five hundred pounds around when your weight starts to drop because your goals are changing and your life is taking such a dramatic shift. I remember being kind of paranoid for a while that somebody's going to notice that I'm lifting less. Oh my God, this is, what am I going to do? This is going to be just a disaster. I'm Somebody's going to find me out before I'm ready. And like I said, if someone's really paying that much attention to how much somebody else is lifting or how fast somebody's running, then they need to focus, refocus their work, their uh, efforts on their own workouts. I do also want to say real quick that your your numbers that you were giving out earlier, as far as how much you you deadlift, you bench, uh, those were pretty impressive. Yeah, <laughs> they took me a while to get up to. Um, I will say, without going into a lot of detail, if you look at some of my other pictures. I will say that I had uh, testosterone to spare. You can take that as you will and do the math. Um, that definitely assisted in those numbers getting up to as high as they were in a relatively short amount of time. Um, I was always a stockier person growing up, so I was never really tiny. Uh, you were very lean in, in your earlier pictures. Uh, I have, was never an extremely lean individual and I probably never will be just because of my build how I know my metabolism works both uh, pre and post HRT commencement um, but um, those numbers definitely have been something that has been something I've been scared to lose as far as my identity as you know a strong woman is something that I find as empowering to me and I have fought very hard to keep what I can keep, even if it's going to drop. And I have to kind of make peace with a new sense of normal. So we did have two other questions in the chat that I want to get to. Uh, this one's from Mackenzie. She asked, do you ever do yoga or anything instead of uh, your power routine? Thoughts on yoga? I occasionally at the end of my workout, if I don't do cardio or if I have a lot of time on the weekend, sometimes I will. Um, I have done yoga in the past. I do enjoy it. I have a hard time not wanting to fall asleep when I do. Um, 
but one of the things that I have started doing is at the end of my workouts, maybe taking 15 minutes or so, going into like the quiet, dark group fitness area when it's not in use, and doing some some stretches, uh, various stretches, just to kind of unwind and center myself. I, that has been very enjoyable and, and very, very... Um, very therapeutic in its own right. And I'm not going to sit here and say the only way that you can be fit is to just pick up heavy things off the ground because that's absolutely not true. And yoga is definitely wonderful, especially for those of us who did lift to such an excessive degree. There's a lot of, of mobility restrictions and stiffness that comes with that. And yoga is a great way to kind of re-loosen, re-loosen, great, uh, English language ability there, um, <laughs> rebuild that uh, flexibility and mobility, especially in the upper body. Um, so yes, I would absolutely advise somebody to do yoga or at least stretching for a period of time after their workouts. Okay, and one final question. This is from Nicole on YouTube. Uh, she asks, what's your opinion on transgender athletes um, the controversy surrounding whether they have a, an unfair advantage or not. Now, I'm, I'm glad that she asked this. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, and I was fully prepared to answer this question because I know it's been a topic in the news. And I might have an unpopular opinion on this one. But personally, given that I benefited from an excess of androgens for many years that definitely increased a lot of my musculature and my strength capabilities that I'm still holding on to those benefits. I would not feel ethical in competing against a cisgender woman of my size. Um, there are a lot of very strong women out there, both cis and trans. Um, so I can't say that it's a, a, a cut and dry issue. Personally, I'm aware that I have an advantage for somebody that might be comparable to my size. I'm still holding on to a lot of those benefits that I had gained over the years. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily a black and white issue, though. A, a younger trans person, a trans woman, hypothetical, um, teenager, never really worked out on hormone therapy, did not have the same advantages advantages, the same effect that testosterone had on their physical strength capabilities, I think would be able to, or should be able to compete because they wouldn't have had that same impact. Um, if they start HRT earlier and early enough, uh, they're going to have more or less very similar to identical uh, development pattern as a cisgender woman. So... I think it's very, very much a case-by-case -case scenario. I know a lot of people are just, we demand the ability, the right to compete. But if you actually sit, you know, sit down and think about it, um, it's definitely not a, a one-size-fits-all kind of question. I mean, I, I, it would not be something that I would feel personally right about doing unless it was against uh, other trans women. Or it was in, uh, and, and this is, I was brainstorming this question before we started tonight, an untested competition with cisgender women where the presence of androgens could be a factor or a, a card that anybody could have. Um, because then the perceived advantages of my earlier development with testosterone being present versus a cisgender woman having been exposed to those uh, traits for a short period of time may may even out a little bit. So it, it's definitely something that, that is, it, it's not, a, there's no simple answer to it. But like, again, I wouldn't feel comfortable with it per presently, but in five to ten years on hormone therapy, who knows what my opinion would be then, because maybe things would have evened out a lot more. 
It's definitely a, a complicated issue and, and one that I personally can see from, from both sides. Um, but yeah, like you said, very complicated. That's it for the questions from the chat. I'll send it back to you too. Great. Thanks, Addison. So, uh, wow, that was great to hear more of your story, Allie. I know we've talked previously, but I never really heard everything like back to back like that. And I had I, to condense. Again, I think it is really important. <laughs> it's really I had to important condense what you're quite doing a bit. Out there. I, but it's I, hard I think for it's me at what times. You shared here. And um, I, I do want to say to people who are who are watching right now too, um, Allie is very open with her story. She shares quite a bit of it through her Instagram, through Facebook. So if you're not already following Allie, please go take a look at her Instagram page and follow her as well. Uh, she's going to continue to share her journey as she goes through this process. And I think that there's a lot more that she can uh, help with for a lot of people who are in similar situations to her. So please go check that out. By all means, I, I have my entire transition, including the prior year leading up to it. So, I mean, I didn't delete things pre-transition. It's all out there for everybody to see. So you can literally witness the back and forth seesaw effect that, that I was going through internally. You know, in chronological order, you can see the, the back and forth uh, overcompensation you know, the the short-lived denial goatee that I had, and then finally the whole, <laughs> okay, let's stop screwing around. Let's let's live our life on our terms the way that we know, you know, to the depths of our soul that we, we need to live. Um, so we, we might even do a whole I episode just on denial beards and denial goatees <laughs> and mustaches. I think that's, yes, that's a whole episode in its, in its own right there. Oh, no, there's a picture. <laughs> uh, yuck. <laughs> oh, and I've, I've put up pictures of, of my denial beard before, too. So they're, they're out there. <laughs> but, Allie, so thank could, you, you so much. So you could combine again. that with the electrolysis. Oh, gosh. <laughs> thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for being open and honest with us tonight here. I think that's important. I also think it's important that you're living your you know, your true self. You are a strong woman, and you're a beautiful strong woman who is out there changing hearts and you are an amazing influence there in your local community and online and i think that you know if when we have those opportunities it's it's awesome to you know be able to be in that role so thank you again for for being with us here tonight thank you for having me it was very very good to be able to tell my story and and i feel very very special that you thought to include me absolutely so let's take a minute here and talk about next week's episode. Next week is going to be a really fun one. Uh, this is one that we've had a lot of questions about. Uh, please join me and Cameron as we are going to be discussing gender confirmation surgery, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I'll be talking about my experiences as uh, somebody in the uh, trans feminine spectrum. Cameron will be talking about his experiences in the trans masculine uh, arena there. It's going to be uh, an interesting conversation. I think that, you know, there's still just a lot of mystery and we're both gonna do our best to be as open and honest as possible next week. And in the meantime, uh, feel free to check out Cameron's work on Instagram and YouTube. He is there under the name Trans Swag. So find him over there. We follow him on our Instagram page so you can find him uh, there if you, if you need help locating his accounts. So let's bring everyone back on here really quick. Just want to say thanks again to Allie for participating here and Addison for running our show. Uh, another good show in the in the books there. So thank you both very much for your, your time here tonight. Thanks for everyone who watched online and participated and submitted questions. And we will see you next week at the same time on Trans IRL.